This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. A warm welcome to all those who have gathered for worship today. We delight to come into God's presence and give him the worship and praise that is due his name. Two uh, announcements, two prayer concerns uh, before the call to worship. First of all, we want to uh, express our sympathy to Rich and Kathy Rosa in the passing of Rich's uh, brother Willis on Thursday evening. Uh, visitation is uh, scheduled at the Van Dyken Duven Funeral Home Monday from four to six, and the uh, funeral will be uh, Tuesday at uh, 10.30 a.m. at uh, First Church, uh, formerly known as First Reformed, not to be confused with Connect, uh, Tuesday at First Church, 10.30 a.m. And uh, we also want to uh, continue to remember in prayer Kathy Franzi, daughter of uh, John and Mickey Bugman. Uh, she underwent bypass surgery on Friday and uh, had a rough day uh, yesterday, although was doing a little better at the end of the day. But uh, she's in need of our uh, continued prayers for her full recovery. Our call to worship today is taken from Psalm 68, Sing to, the, sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. O oh, sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides on the heaven of heavens, which were of old. Indeed, he sends out his voice, a mighty voice, ascribe strength to God. His excellence is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O oh, God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. Indeed, our God is one who is strong and who gives strength to his people. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a great God, and we come today to ascribe strength to you and to proclaim your excellence, that you are indeed a holy God, awesome, and that you are a God who is gracious to us, your people, by giving us power and strength as well. So we come to bless your name. Help us, O Father, to worship you in spirit and truth, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let us praise God by singing from the same psalm from which our call to worship was taken, 68a, and we'll sing stanzas one, eight, and 12. And you'll have to turn the page to find uh, stanza 12, but uh, 1, 8, and 12 of number 68A.
Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear now God's will for our lives as it is recorded for us in the Ten Commandments, reading from Deuteronomy chapter 5. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, And the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Our Lord in his teaching summarized the law by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, These two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us respond to God's law by confessing together in song our need for his grace and forgiveness using selection number 177, singing all three stanzas of 177.
When we come before God with grief and shame, when we fall prostrate before him and are sorely pressed by the guilt of our sin and cry out to him, we are assured that indeed he is a gracious and forgiving God. We hear from the Apostle Peter in his Pentecost sermon these words, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children, to all who are far off, as, the many, as many as the Lord our God will call. Indeed, God's promise is to all those who repent of their sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who trust in him. His promise is that just as water washes dirt from the body, so the blood of Christ washes away all our sin so that we are now through faith in him justified through the Lord Jesus Christ and God is angry with us no more. Thanks be to God. Let us come to God now in congregational prayer. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts before you on this the Lord's day, the day of resurrection and new life. We thank you that you have set apart one day in seven as a day where we are privileged to rest from our ordinary labors and to remember to rest in the completed work of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who loved us, who gave his life for us, that through the forgiveness of sins we might be forgiven, that we might be adopted as your children, and that we might be made heirs of eternal life. We pray, Father, that we may rejoice in that salvation that we may rejoice in the Lord and in all that he has done for us. We know that life is filled with grievous trials and we do not rejoice in them, but we rejoice in what Christ has done for us as he will deliver us from all the trials and tribulations of this life and bring us into a glorious inheritance in the world to come. We pray, Father, that you would be with those of our number and our loved ones near and far who are recovering from illness or injury or surgeries, who are suffering from chronic health uh, illness or from pain uh, for which there is no hope of recovery in this life. Grant healing if it be your will or great, grant patience and hope for that day when you shall make all things new. We pray that you would comfort those who mourn. We pray especially for uh, Rich and uh, Kathy and for their family in the passing of Rich's uh, uh, oldest brother, Willis. We pray that you would be with the family as they gather for visitation and for the funeral. May the gospel be proclaimed clearly and boldly so that uh, even in the midst of our grief, we may have hope. We pray, Father, for uh, those who are ill. We remember especially uh, Norm Dieleman, that you would be close to him and Jan and uh, with Norm's mother as well. We pray that you'd be with the whole family uh, we pray that uh, we may see your hand of mercy at work in Norm's life, relieve the pain and discomfort that he has, give his doctors wisdom to know how best to treat him, and may they abound in hope, knowing that uh, whether we live or die, we are not our own, but belong to our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, who has fully delivered us from all our sins and set us free from the tyranny of the devil and watches over us now that not a hair can fall from our head except it be your will. We pray too for Kathy Frangie. We thank you that uh, her surgery went well and uh, that uh, though she had a rough day yesterday, she was uh, feeling uh, better at the end of the day and doing better. We pray that she may continue to recovery, have mercy upon her and her family also, her parents. And uh, we pray that you would be close to them. May we see your hand of mercy at work in her life as well. Father, we pray for uh, our elderly members who are unable to uh, worship uh, with us anymore uh, because they are in uh, senior facilities and uh, are uh, restricted in their mobility. We pray for Tim Denbeston and Harold and Carolyn Voss and for Marilyn Hartman. Be close to them and uh, strengthen them this day. 
We uh, pray also for those who are unable to come to church uh, and enjoy the, the fellowship of the saints as they once did. Uh, be with Lauren Deswart and Larry Gullion and Wilma Minders and Gladys DeRoy and Mary Van Gorp and Diane Stamm and Betty Van Donselaar and Mike Vanderwill. We pray, Father, that you would be with these and any others who are unable to be here. Uh, we pray that you would bless and strengthen them and encourage them day by day. Comfort uh, and encourage those who, because of weakness and infirmities, are uh, 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 struggling with, uh, with pain and uh, weakness. We pray that uh, we would not lose heart, but continue to uh, uh, look to that day when you shall make all things new. Father, we pray for uh, our community uh, medical facilities. We thank you for the Pella Regional Health Center, and we thank you for uh, other uh, facilities uh, with doctors and nurses and uh, aides, and we thank you for the pharmacies and uh, pharmacists. We thank you for all those who work hard to keep us healthy and well, and pray that you would use them to uh, encourage us and, and help us day by day. Father, we pray that you would be uh, with uh, each and every member of your uh, church and uh, that you would uh, strengthen our faith day by day, draw back to yourself and the church any who are drifting away, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together for public worship. We pray that you would convict their heart of the need to uh, come again and uh, publicly call upon the name of the Lord with your saints. We pray that you would work by your word and spirit to make our covenant youth desirous of professing their faith publicly, be with those with whom Reverend Lubbers is uh, presently meeting in preparation for public profession of faith, that you would confirm that desire by making uh, your uh, gospel clear in their lives. We pray, Father, that you would be with families and bless the families of the church, enable husbands and wives to live together in love and fulfill their marriage vows, uh, be with uh, children that they may uh, uh, dutifully uh, submit to their parents, uh, which uh, delights the Lord, and uh, pray that they may uh, learn obedience uh, from their parents. We pray that uh, parents would uh, bring up their children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, and that they may be given grace to uh, uh, show them the, the path of life, both in word and in action. We pray for single parents that they too may be strengthened for the difficult tasks that face them and may they feel the support and encouragement of uh, the body of Christ. We pray for expectant mothers that they may bring forth healthy, well-born children at the proper time and bring much uh, joy. And uh, we pray that you would extend your covenant mercies uh, from generation to generation. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we go about our daily tasks and do the work that you have given us to do. We know that you are a God who works and you created us in your image so that indeed um, the purpose of our, our lives is to, to do the work that you have given us to do, whether that's uh, in the, uh, on the farm or uh, in the factory, uh, in the home, uh, wherever you have placed us, whether we are working for money or uh, working uh, as volunteers. We pray, Father, that we may rejoice in the work that you have given us to do and find much joy and satisfaction in it and be a blessing to those around us who benefit from our labors. Be with any who are looking for work that they may find work suitable to their gifts and calling. And be with our young people as they undergo their education that they may do so with a view to uh, sharpening their gifts to, to fulfill whatever calling you have for them uh, in this world. We pray that you would continue to strengthen the leaders of this congregation, be with uh, our pastor and the elders and the deacons. May they uh, indeed care for the flock for whom Christ died. Uh, we pray that you would equip them with uh, wisdom and dedication, with uh, a humble heart and uh, uh, a heart of devotion to you and for the flock for whom Christ died. Give them wisdom to know what is right and the courage to do it. We pray that you would continue to strengthen reverent lovers, that he may preach the gospel boldly and clearly, gathering in the lost and uh, building up your people. Give him a restful time of uh, vacation and enable him to return in due time. We pray, Father, that you would uh, bless the plans that are being made for task. Uh, for the group of young people who will be coming here 
shortly. We pray that uh, that work may uh, proceed well and might be a rich spiritual experience uh, for all who are involved. Bless us also as we bring our offerings for the Christian Education Assistance Fund later in the service. We pray that we may give cheerfully uh, and gratitude for all that you have done and give wisdom to the deacons as they administer these funds that they may be good stewards of them and bring encouragement to those who need it. We ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Let us continue to worship God in song by singing selection number 401 and we'll sing stanzas four, five, six, and seven. Uh, stanzas four, five, six, and seven of number 400 one Holy Spirit of Messiah. Our scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, page 1183 in the Pew Bible, page 1183, Luke 4, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan 
and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you, ser you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it. Beloved of the Lord, this event, the temptations of Jesus occurs shortly after his baptism at the Jordan in which he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. The anointing was his appointment to the role of Christ, uh, Savior. Uh, he was appointed prophet, priest, and king. And the anointing was his equipping with power. He was uh, received power through the Holy Spirit to carry out the ministry uh, with which he had been entrusted. And now being filled with the Holy Spirit, Luke tells us in verse one of our text, he returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, but also tested of God. It's important to take note here that uh, Jesus is being tempted to use his power and privileged position to his own advantage rather than to use his power and privileged position uh, to do the will of his Father and do the work that God has called him to do. It's important to note that Satan addresses Jesus twice in the first and third temptation as son of God. But each time in all three temptations, Jesus answers uh, as uh, according to the duties of ordinary man. Satan reminds Jesus that he is God's son to see if he'll use that position to serve his own needs. Now God allows this temptation in order to reveal to us Jesus' heart of devotion to his Father and to doing his Father's will, not his own will. Uh, God does this not only to show us the uprightness of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, but also to encourage us in our struggle with temptation. Because Jesus prevailed, all of you who are united to Jesus by faith are also strengthened to resist temptations. Because of this uh, incident, because Jesus prevailed and because the Spirit of Christ lives in us, uh, the command to resist the devil and draw near to God, found in James 4, that command to resist the devil is not an impossible command. We can begin to do it. We can begin to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, and we're able to begin to put on the whole armor of God and stand against the schemes of the, of the devil, as Paul writes in uh, Ephesians 6. But now before we look at each of these temptations, we need to see them in a broader context and recognize uh, two things about them. Uh, first, that they are, uh, or, or recognize one thing about them, uh, that they are not unique 
but not unique in two ways. Uh, the first way in which these temptations are not unique is that this is not the first time that the Son of God has been tempted. That phrase, Son of God, you know, is applied to Adam. Luke, uh, at the end of chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, the last verse of that chapter, uh, Adam is called the Son of God. And the Son of God was tempted and tested of the devil. Also, uh, Israel as a nation are not only the children of God, they collectively are called the Son of God. When Moses uh, spoke to Pharaoh, he said, Israel is my firstborn son. And we know that Israel as God's son was tempted of the devil and tested by God also in the wilderness. And now we see Jesus the eternal Son of God made man. He too is Son of God, and he also is tempted of the devil and tested of God. But not only is this not the first time the Son of God has been tempted, the temptations themselves are not unique in that in each instance that I've mentioned, uh, Adam and Israel and Jesus, the temptations are essentially the same. They differ in some circumstance, but the essence of them is the same. All three were tempted regarding their bodily appetites. Adam and Eve saw the apple and it looked good to eat. and They, they wanted to eat it. That was uh, satisfying the cravings of the flesh. Israel in the wilderness craved uh, melons and leeks and onions and, and meat. Uh, they weren't content to wait until they got to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey and all the other things that they uh, missed from Egypt, uh, but in even greater uh, abundance. And of course, uh, Jesus is tempted because he too is hungry. So all three are tempted with regard to their bodily appetites. All three were also tested, uh, tempted to, uh, to grasp for power. Uh, Adam and Eve uh, wanted to be like God, knowing good and evil. That is, they wanted to determine for themselves what is right and what is wrong. They didn't want to be under God's authority. They want to uh, put themselves in the place of God with regard to authority. Israel in the wilderness had a problem too, submitting to authority. Korah, Datham, and Abiram rebelled against uh, Moses and Aaron. Even, Moses, even Aaron and Miriam rebelled against Moses. They all resented being under authority and wanted to be a law unto themselves. And of course, Jesus is tempted to grasp at power, power that is rightfully his, but not until his father uh, exalts him and uh, not until he completes the plan of God for his uh, suffering and death. Uh, and all three were tempted with regard to the truthfulness of the word of God, testing the word of God. Uh, Satan lied to Adam and Eve, you won't die. And so uh, Adam and Eve probably thought, well, Let's see whether that's true or not. Maybe, maybe Satan's right. And they, they uh, doubted the word of God. They disbelieved the word of God. The truthfulness of the word of God is called into question for Adam and Eve. Likewise, uh, every time Israel in the wilderness was experiencing problems, they said, is God with us or not? Is God with us or not? And of course, the promise of the covenant uh, I will be your God and you will be my people is the Emmanuel promise. It's the promise of God's presence. It's also the promise of the Spirit because God is with us by the Spirit. And so God was with them, but they wondered, well, there's no water. So is God with us or not? They're, they're, they're doubting the promise of God. And of course, Jesus also is tempted to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple to see whether the words of Psalm 92 would come true and whether the angels would uh, catch him and prevent him from dashing his foot against a stone. So all three are tempted with regard to their bodily appetites. All three are tempted to grasp for power. All three are uh, tempted to call into question uh, the word of God. And of course, the story doesn't stop there because you who believe in Jesus are also sons of God. Uh, remember that the Bible says that all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And 
Uh, Paul says in Galatians 3, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. And Galatians 4, and because you are sons of God, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You are all sons of God, and that includes uh, you who are female. You too are sons of God, and you shouldn't be offended at that uh, being called a son of God. Uh, It's not uh, a put down of your femininity. It's an exaltation of your exalted status in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, females had very little right of inheritance but in the New Testament, God treats male and female the same with respect to inheritance. And husbands are told to uh, live with their wives according to knowledge because they are joint heirs with you of the grace of life. Women inherit the blessings of the covenant as fully as men do in the New Testament. And so you are all treated as sons with respect to your inheritance. And uh, we are all sons. But if we are all sons, then like... Adam, the Son of God, and like Israel, the Son of God, and like Jesus, the Son of God, you ought to expect to be tempted of the devil and tested of God. Uh, Since we are all his sons, we too will be tested. And so we need to look closely at these temptations uh, so that we might gain wisdom as to how to deal with them when they come into our lives as well. Now, with regard to the first temptation, the temptation of bodily appetites, bodily appetites are not sinful in themselves. God created them, and uh, everything that God creates is good. But God does place limitations and restrictions on the gratification of bodily appetites. And with respect to Jesus, uh, he was led by the Spirit to fast. That means he knew it was God's will for him to fast. It was all right, it was permissible to eat, but not if God says fast for 40 days. And we shouldn't be surprised that that happened. Uh, Moses fasted for 40 days when he received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And uh, Jesus is the greater Moses, so we expect to see something similar in Jesus' life as what uh, Moses experienced. Uh, It wasn't sinful for Jesus to eat, but not until he had fulfilled his uh, full fast. Now, because he was fully human, he was hungry. And because he was fully divine, he had the power to create bread out of stones. He would later turn uh, water into wine, and he would multiply the the loaves and the fishes to feed 5,000. He certainly could turn uh, stones into bread. And Satan recognizes that he is uh, hungry and uh, appeals to his bodily appetites. Now, you know that bodily appetites are, are uh, hard to, uh, to control. If you ever tried to diet, you know it's really hard to be hungry all the time. And if your uh, doctor tells you that you need to make some dietary changes to uh, lower your intake of uh, fat and uh, cholesterol, uh, that, that's hard. Uh, fat is flavor, and uh, America's favorite meal is uh, cheeseburger, fries, and a shake. Uh, uh, how are you going to resist America's favorite meal all the time? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard. Uh, and uh, if you've ever tried to uh, stop smoking or uh, stop any addictive substance or behavior, you know that it is hard. King David was not in doubt about the seventh commandment. He knew that adultery was wrong, but sexual desire is hard to discipline, and he fell into sin. Well, you can be sure that Satan will often tempt you to gratify your bodily appetites apart from and contrary to the Word of God. Which brings up the question, then, how did Jesus succeed here? How did, he, how did he resist temptation? Well, he resisted temptation by remembering God's word and God's will. He quotes from Scripture, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's quoting Moses, Moses who said, That's the lesson of the manna from heaven. Uh, the lesson of the manna was that we, we live by, by what God says, not by, uh, by the food that, that we need to eat. And uh, 
it's important for you and for me that we too know the Word of God and uh, remember the Word of God and uh, raise up in our minds, uh, hide it in our hearts that we not, not sin against uh, God. Uh, hear the words of uh, Proverbs chapter 6. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. And again from Proverbs 7, my son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister and call understanding your nearest kin. You know, again and again, he says, uh, bind them on your heart. Uh, bind them, uh, write them on the tablet of your heart. We have to know God's word. <laughs> we have to hide that word in our heart that, that we might not sin against God. If you know the will of God, then you can uh, be strengthened to resist. The temptation is there, but you say, oh, okay, uh, uh, a well-marbled steak with cheesy potatoes and veggies covered with butter sauce. But the sixth commandment says, you shall not murder. And the catechism says that means not only that you don't murder your neighbor, it also means that you don't endanger your own life. Uh, you uh, don't, uh, uh, expose yourself to uh, uh, danger. And uh, there's a lot of food that is, tastes good, but is a danger to eat. And we need to remember the sixth commandment and uh, uh, as we uh, prepare our meals and plan our meals so that in, we can do it in such a way as to not uh, bring harm uh, or reckless endangerment to ourselves. But Jesus not only remembered the word of God, he was also strengthened with the Holy Spirit. Uh, our text begins with full of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit indeed is a source of strength, not only for Jesus, but for his people. When he was preparing to ascend to heaven, Jesus told his disciples to go to Jerusalem and to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, for they would, quote, receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You're going to get power when the Spirit comes. And that's not just for the 12 apostles. Jesus prays the same thing for, or, or Paul prays the same thing for the whole church in Ephesians 3. Uh, he prays uh, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. And uh, he writes to the Romans, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. Uh, every believer has received the gift of the Spirit by which God is with us, by which he is our God and we are his people, and that Spirit gives strength, strength to do what God has called us to do. Jesus met temptation with the Word of God and with the power of the Spirit, and sets an example for us to do the same. The second temptation concerns grasping for power. Satan offered Jesus authority to rule over all the nations of the earth. Now, when I read that, the big question in my mind was, can Satan do that? <laughs> Is he the ruler of the kingdoms of the earth? Does he have the power to, to offer that? Is that something that is his to give? Well, not legally. He is a usurper. He is a supplanter. He is like a squatter living in someone else's house. He has no legal right to rule. However, when the nations turn their back on God, God in turn turns his back on them. We read in Romans 1 how when the wicked abandon God, God in turn abandons them and gives them up to their wickedness, and he lets Satan have his way with them. Uh, Satan is uh, uh, 
uh, said to uh, be the one who deceives the nations, although in Revelation 20, verse 2, it says in the new age, he will deceive the nations no longer, which means he once did deceive the nations. Uh, he, in fact, uh, is the deceiver of the whole world, Re Revelation 12:9. Uh, the Bible refers to him as the prince of the power of the air. It refers to him as having a kingdom and having a dominion. And it is in that sense that Satan presumes to offer the nations to Jesus. Now, the temptation is very perceptive of Satan because Satan knows the Old Testament. He knows Psalm 2. He knows that it's God's plan to make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. Jesus is destined to rule all the nations. Satan knows that. But uh, he offers them now to Jesus in a way that will spare Jesus the suffering and death uh, of the cross. Uh, he probably anticipates that Jesus uh, dreads dying. We know that Jesus did uh, with respect to his human nature. Pray, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Uh, he didn't look forward to uh, the agony of death on the cross and bearing the wrath of God against the sin of the world. And Satan, uh, perceiving something of that, says, here's the easy way. You can get all the things that you're destined for you just have to bow down and worship me. But again, Jesus meets temptation with uh, the knowledge of the word of God. You shall worship the Lord and him only shall you serve. Uh, he would have to violate his father's will in order to get that power and he doesn't want to violate his father's will. He's come not to do his own will but the will of him who sent him. Now, is grasping for power something that you and I also wrestle with? Well, yes, indeed. Uh, like Adam and like Israel, we all chafe under authority and want to be our own authority. Children rebel from in infancy. Uh, teens are always pushing the limits, and adults also want to uh, not have anyone over them. Uh, we hear a lot today about people who want to be spiritual but not religious. And what that boils down to simply is, I want to invent my own religion and I don't want any authority, any earthly authority like a church uh, telling me how I ought to live, even if the church is only telling you what the Bible tells you. Uh, no, I, I want to decide for myself. I, uh, I believe in spiritual realities, but uh, I get to determine what they are and how I'm uh, going to live. Uh, you who are college students or uh, may have had a professor or ha will have a professor who's going to uh, tempt you in this area, he, he might say something like, I'm not going to tell you what to believe. I'm just going to tell you to question everything. Well, in saying that, he is telling you what to believe. He's telling you to believe that you have the right to judge everything for yourself. You have the right to be the ultimate authority, that there is no authority over you, no God who has the right to tell you, do this or don't do that. He's tempting you to rebel against God's authority and not submit to his word. It's a sad truth that a sizable number of people in our country uh, and in the Western world, uh, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but it's a, a majority, I'm sure, a sizable number support uh, gay rights and they support abortion. Not because they are gay and not because they anticipate having an abortion, but because they, re they don't like the idea of moral absolutes. They don't like the idea that there are things that are right for everybody and things that are wrong for everybody. If we say that all abortions are wrong, and abortion is murder, and it's, it's wrong for everyone all the time, then uh, that means there is a, a, an absolute law, and if there's an absolute law, there is a, a lawgiver, 
and a lawgiver to whom we must give account, not in just those two areas, but in every area of our life. And so to reject the authority of God, we support those who say uh, there is no ultimate right and wrong. It's uh, up to each individual to decide for themselves, uh, my body, my choice, you know, uh, that's that sort of thing. Everybody is a law unto themselves. Yes, we do grasp for power uh, and uh, rebel against authority. Now, there is a sense which, like Jesus, we are destined for greater things. Uh, Jesus was destined to have the power that Satan offered to him, and uh, we too, I think, are destined for greater honor and glory. After all, one of us, a human being, is sitting alongside God on the throne and uh, ruling on his behalf. And uh, we know that uh, had Adam not sinned, he would have been crowned with glory and honor. God would still be God. But uh, uh, we must, like Jesus, first learn obedience through suffering. Jesus wasn't exalted until he first learned obedience through suffering, and we too must be made perfect before God exalts us and crowns us with glory and honor. We must be content not to grasp for power now, but wait until God bestows it. In this life, by the power of the Spirit, we must resist the temptation to be a law unto ourselves and to grasp for glory and power. God will crown us in his own time. Uh, when our faith is made perfect. Now, the third temptation concerns questioning the truthfulness of the Word of God. Uh, this is a temptation which I think can easily, uh, we can all easily relate to. Uh, God makes a lot of promises, and it often seems as if those promises are not being fulfilled. They aren't working. There's a cancer diagnosis. There's the death of a young child. There's a broken marriage. There's a world in chaos. Or whatever it is that's making your life miserable causes you too to say like uh, Israel at Massa and Meribah, is God with us or not? Where is his promise to work all things together for good? Where is his promise to bless us abundantly and to uh, fill us with peace? Uh, well, we need to remember the word of God <laughs> that Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. Peter says, now you have to suffer grief through all kinds of trials. The late Reverend Tim Keller, a man from whom I learned a great deal, was uh, diagnosed four years before his death with pancreatic cancer. Uh, he underwent a, a clinical trial treatment that uh, prolonged his life longer than most people who get pancreatic cancer, but uh, still he knew it was a terminal illness. And in one interview, he said, he said, I'm not fighting this cancer. He says, my doctors are fighting the cancer. He says, what I'm fighting is the battle of faith. That is, he too wondered, why is God doing this to me? And where are his promises? He was a younger man than me. He still, uh, had he lived, would have had many great sermons and, and great books. Uh, he could have done uh, a lot more work, and he was wondering, why? Why is God taking me? Uh, he was struggling with his faith and with the promises of God. Now, uh, there's no evidence that he gave in to those temptations, but by his own admission, he had to wrestle with them, and we wrestle with them too. Is God with us or not? Well, we should not give in to that temptation. Uh, we should not question God's promises. Uh, we shouldn't question the truthfulness of the Word of God. Why? Well, because God has, has made so many things clear to us. First, he's, he's made clear to us that He is a powerful God. Uh, his eternal power, his Godhead are clearly seen in the things that are made. There is evidence all around us in creation that God exists, that he has created all things, that he holds all things in his power. We ought not to doubt that he is in charge and uh, that he will indeed work all things together for our good. Uh, the, uh, the evidence of the truth of the gospel is uh, overwhelming. 
For example, the resurrection was witnessed by over 500 witnesses, uh, many of whom, if not all of whom, were either imprisoned or beaten or whipped or martyred, but they never changed their story. Well, you can't get better historical evidence for an event than that kind of evidence. Uh, the evidence supporting the gospel is not uh, something that is light and immaterial. It is overwhelming, and we ought to believe that indeed Jesus came into this world and is who he says he is and did what the Scripture says he did. We should not doubt God's word. And above all, you should not doubt his love. Because even though your life may be filled with pain and grief and sorrow, you know that he loved you and that he paid for your sins on the cross. He suffered the wrath of God in your place so that your sins might be forgiven, so that you might be adopted, and that you might be made heirs of eternal life. We should set our hopes not on the golden years, <laughs> but on the grace that will be given to us on the day of Jesus Christ when he returns, when he comes and he wipes every tear from our eye and there's no more death, no more pain, no more suffering, but all things made new. We need to be patient and keep the hope, faith and set our hope on what he's going to do when he comes again. You have God's word, his promise that he will do it. And you have the spirit of Christ living in you, a source of power that can never be exhausted. You have all the resources that uh, you need to say no to temptation and yes to God. Like Adam and Israel, we will indeed fail from time to time and uh, more times than not. But because of Jesus, the story is not over. United to him by faith, you can begin again each day. His mercies are new every morning. We can make real progress in obedience in this life. And you have the assurance that when you do fail, your sins are forgiven. He is not angry with you and that his grace continues to surround you. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he came and was tempted of the devil and that through that temptation you showed us his heart of devotion to you and to doing your will. May we likewise be given a heart of devotion to you in gratitude for all that you have done for us and strengthened by your word of and spirit, may we begin to have progress against temptation in our lives also. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue to respond to God's word by singing selection number 327, My Dear Redeemer and My Lord. We'll sing all the stanzas, standing if you're able.
Let us worship God now with our gifts and tithes and offering. The offering is for the Christian Education Assistance Fund. After the offering, without further announcement, we'll sing, uh, stand to sing uh, 118B, stanzas seven and eight, and remain standing for the benediction.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.